Good afternoon, everyone. It's March the 2nd, uh, and we're here for all things SOPA. Um, so if you were expecting something else, um, this is a weekly uh, session that we do just to really give you some background on what SOPA is and, and things that we're doing at the LTC to help um, and to bring people together and ask questions and um, try to get those answered for you. And we'll do some how to at the end um, after we go through the kind of the main thing. So if you want to stick around at the end, we can do that. Um, let me just copy again. The um, slideshow is on the screen, but I'll put it in the chat just so you have it. And then also the Slido link is in there as well to join the the Slido because we'll use that as we go along as well. Uh, these sessions are recorded and they are available um, on YouTube and I have them set up with chapters so we'll be able you'll be able to find specific things that you're uh, wanting to get access to beyond today. So if there's something that you're thinking about that you want to revisit, uh, just make a note of it and um, you can find that uh, as we go. So as um, you guys kind of put in there how you're feeling on March 2nd, um, as far as uh, SOPA goes. Um, if I just want to introduce myself, my name's Chris Worley. I'm the Director of Technology Services for the Learning Technology Center. Um, and my role past few months has really been focused on SOPA and cybersecurity and then those types of things. So um, what we're doing here with this weekly uh, session is just to get you more familiar with things that are around SOPA um, and um, trying to not make you feel as overwhelmed, um, but maybe doing this every week is making you feel overwhelmed, um, but hopefully it's it's doing some uh, helping as at the same time. So uh, the, the main thing that we're trying to accomplish here is uh, give you some how-to, some suggestions, give you some statistics on what's happening and then also um, answer some questions. And then we'll also do some how-to at the end of the conversation. So um, I think the main thing, and I, as I look at the word cloud and um, hopefully you guys can see the word cloud too, I just assume you can, um, is that we try to just, I think the main thing to think about is that we're working in this together. It's not something that you're doing on your own. Um, when you do start to feel overwhelmed, I think I think um, the main thing is to know that uh, as I always felt as a one man tech person, tech shop, uh, that it's good to be around other people that are, are thinking about these things and talking about these things. And so, um, I guess my main thing is just don't don't feel overwhelmed because um, one way or another we'll we'll get past July first and um, move on from there and and we'll we'll tackle this as we go. Uh, there's also in Slido the opportunity for you to ask questions. So if you have a question, um, it's also available for you to upvote other people's questions and we'll try to get those answered. Um, today and if we can't get them answered today we will definitely um, get back with you as far as questions go so feel free to use that slido to ask questions as opposed to the chat uh, so the first question is what is sopa and this uh, link or this page uh, is really a, the best place for you to get some initial information about sopa in general uh, some of the other stuff that we're going to do today, this is this is really the only like part that is what is SOPA and why do we have to do this and all that kind of stuff. The other stuff is going to be more how to and and actually moving you towards um, fulfilling SOPA. Uh, but the the things I point out are the video that's on this uh, resource page, um, also the uh, legislative brief that we actually um, brought out about a year ago at the IDEA conference uh, that people uh, could see it all on one page. But then also the Robin Schwartz in brief is a good summary of SOPA and how um, what, what SOPA is about and why we're doing it. And then ultimately I just, I'm participating 
in Kosin virtually um, as well today in Lynetta Tai, who's um, does a lot of stuff for Coles, uh, for Kosin, but also has a book about student data privacy. She really points out that it's the right thing to do, uh, whether or not we had a law or not, we should be um, knowing where our data is at and who has a, access to it and what they're doing with it. So um, yes, it's a, a law, but also it's it's the right thing to do. So, and I think I do this every week. I click on the page and I'm gonna take that link off of there. Um, <laughs> so I already kind of went through the weekly agenda. These are the statistics for this week. And um, just the, the right-hand column there is the, uh, this week, and actually it's outdated already because I have a few more requests in my email uh, for Pete, for districts to uh, join the, the SDPC, the ISPA. And um, so that number will go up already uh, for next week. Um, but just looking at the numbers and, and seeing the progress that's being made, I think is beneficial to everybody to know that uh, there is there are things happening and people are doing things. And um, I think it's it's gonna, what we're doing is working. So um, just keep doing it, I guess, is my suggestion there. And another part of just the weekly thing is just to uh, show you some of the originating agreements that have uh, been added um, since the last time. And so this is a is a view of, of those, a listing of those, uh, just for you to reference at a later date. And so moving on to tips and suggestions. Um, and we kind of, I've been kind of focused over the last few weeks about um, the database and the agreements and all those types of things. But I also realized that SOPA is also about having reasonable security practices for your district. And one of the things that we've done at the LTC, and we're still um, promoting this as, as a way for you to kind of have a starting point for cybersecurity is to utilize the CIS controls and the um, primarily the implementation group one, which is um, a set of 43 different um, sub, sub controls that cover everything from inventory of hardware and software to um, as well as um, as well as um, backups and incident response plans and, and all those types of things. So check out those links, they're available to you. And then also the CSAT cloud and, and pro, this is something we actually had a presentation at Secure Ed Schools um, and I can make that available as well to, to you guys. Um, but it's a, it's a tool that allows you to document what you're doing in your district when it comes to cybersecurity and, and what you're what you're doing in the area of backups or what you're doing in the area of um, incident response or inventory of your hardware and software. And so it's just a, a way for you to help keep track of those types of things and know what's going on. So that's a kind of more technology related than um, other things necessarily with regards to SOPA. Um, Another thing, I just want to revisit the Illinois NDPA and, and kind of talk a little bit about um, what it is and, and why we're using it. Um, so the, the most recent um, NDPA will always be on the, uh, the website. If you go to the, uh, this link here, this will take you to the LTC Illinois page. And if you visit the ISPA website, you'll be able to find the uh, data privacy agreement there. Uh, that'll be the latest and greatest version uh, as we um, continue to look at making this a better plan for everybody. Um, and so that's, that's where you're going to get the latest and greatest. And then just a few things about the, the plan. The idea behind the Illinois NDPA is that um, it's common amongst everybody in the sense that uh, if you take this to your superintendent, your school board, your legal counsel, and say, this is the agreement that we're basing our data privacy on, they can say, okay, we're going to, we agree with that and we're going to use that. Um, 
the benefit of that is, is it's common. And if every school district does something similar, then as we, um, some of the functionality built into that agreement is that you can accept other people's agreements and move along with that. Um, that same agreement as somebody else is using. So the reason why, and I'm getting um, people that are asking for editable PDFs and, and Word documents, and, and those just aren't gonna be available, um, just because if we have vendors changing the Illinois NDPA or we have um, school districts changing the Illinois NDPA, then every time that that change is made, your school district, if you're going to subscribe to that, you would have to take that back to your legal counsel and say, can you look at this? Something's been changed. I need to get this okay so that I can sign this agreement and post it. Um, so there's very rarely going to be any, any sense of going to be an edible PDF, whether it's for a school district or whether it's for a vendor. Um, a component of the Illinois NDPA is Exhibit H, which allows you to make changes to uh, the agreement or add things that you want to add. And we would want to limit that use of the Exhibit H for the exact same reason that we don't want changes made in the Illinois NDPA in the sense that if you, if a school district adds an Exhibit H, then every school district that would want to do something similar to that agreement would have to have that Exhibit H uh, looked at by your legal counsel to make sure that everything in there is still upholds law and, and those types of things, or whether it's just a arbitrary thing that one particular lawyer decided that they wanted in there. Um, there may be good reason for it, but your lawyer has to agree to that because they're the, going to be the ones that are going to defend you if, if there ever is a, a situation where you need to be defended. Um, also, as far as uh, for companies that are new to data privacy agreements or new to, um, am I all right, Beth? Okay. <laughs> You're the only one that's got your camera on, so I'm talking to you. Um, the, we put I'm some samples. You got okay. it, we're all, all here. Right. All right, thanks. Uh, the sample communication uh, document that's part of our resources is there for you guys to use and provide feedback to me and other people as far as if it's working or not working. But that would be if you have an initial uh, communication with somebody, use that uh, with a vendor, use that to explain the NDPA um, document. Uh, they should, more and more should be getting accustomed to this because states across the country have been doing uh, data privacy agreements for a long time. Um, the National Data Privacy Agreement is new. It's new as, a, well, we're coming up on a year now in July um, that it was released, but they should start to know that it's available. Uh, the, at the national level, there's conversations going on with places like Google and Adobe and, and different things. So uh, using the NDPA and then having the Illinois part of it um, is what we need to have signed uh, for our for our part of it and to be have our agreements and be SOPA compliant. Um, and then just want to kind of just give a shout out to a couple people that have brought about, not they haven't caused the issues, they've brought about the uh, reporting of some issues that I think may have to do with my lack of knowledge uh, with fillable PDFs. So I'm working through some of those issues as far as um, when a vendor signs an issue, signs a PDF and sends it back, is it still editable? And, and some of those work little technical issues. So if you're experiencing some issues with the fillable document, as far as um, little things, as far as the technology goes, please let me know and, and I'll uh, add those to my list of, of things that I'm trying to figure out with it. But ultimately, it seems like it's working for a majority of people, but if you are having issues, please let me know um, with that. So, um, and one more thing, um, and I just saw this, I think in one of the email forms, I don't remember if it was Tech Geeks or if it was the mobilized community, but um, anytime you're, you don't have to use the Illinois NDPA. 
you can utilize any agreement that you want. Your your you can use your own legal team's agreement. Um, you can use the vendor's agreement. Uh, but when you use any agreement, you should have that looked at by your legal counsel. So if you get a an agreement from a vendor that says, "Hey, I want you to sign this agreement," make sure that that gets looked at by your um, legal counsel to know that that is legitimate. Um, ideally, uh, for the benefit of you and for everybody else, if we could somehow get in front of them the Illinois NDPA by using that sample communication to at least send that in, um, to them so that they understand that there is benefit to them as well as there is to all the school districts in the state of Illinois. And then uh, just one more um, tip and suggestion is to uh, utilize this link to um, make suggestions on new features, um, little things, big things, uh, workflows, um, screens, names of uh, fields, whatever it may be that you're encountering when you uh, are using the SDPC ISPA tools. Um, I know one thing that uh, we've talked about has been a field for um, subcontractors would be nice to have um, so that we could list out that information and have that available. Um, so please utilize, this is going to the national level. This is not something that we're doing at the LTC, but um, it is something that the national level, they'll look at all the requests and then try to prioritize and figure out what makes it better. Better um, If there's certain things that are too much information on a screen, is there not enough information on a screen? Is there a better way to look at the database? Just little things like that. Um, feel free to flood that with your, um, with your suggestions. And even if you think that um, the suggestions already been made, feel free, it's all right if we have duplicates, they'll go through the duplicates and, and find those. So um, just like I always told um, my teachers and administrators, if you don't send a tech request, we're not gonna, gonna know about it. And I'd rather know if there's 10 people having the same issue, there may be, that's a priority and, and we need to know about it. So as far as resources, uh, one of the additional resources that, um, I just want to make sure that you're aware that Angela Veach is, is part of our ILTPP team, and she is going to um, kind of help look through the database and, and make sure that we're making effective use of the database um, and being consistent with dates and with agreement types and all that kind of stuff. So uh, at some point, she may reach out to you, and I just want to make sure that you're aware that she's part of our team and, and will be um, Re maybe reaching out to you to help um, with certain situations and um, and but as far as initial contact at this point, uh, you can reach out to me and make sure that um, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on, uh, but she may respond to you as well. Um, just again, just a I think needs to be in the day in the the slide deck just so that it's always there is just that this is the main landing point for uh, where the resources are going to be available and, and are, um, we'll add new things there. Um, and so just always use this as kind of your starting point for uh, accessing the database and, and just having access to the different resources. Additional resource here is the YouTube playlist and, and I promoted that at the very beginning, but we'll continue to add tutorial videos. We're working on getting some tutorial videos made up for different things within the database. There are two full length videos there that are broke down into different topics that are available to you, but we'll also work on getting shorter um, one and two minute videos available to you for specific things. So that if you do reach out, we can send you a link to a video and then you'll have that as a resource and not have to search through a longer video to find it. And then also all the things SOPA, all things SOPA sessions, the recordings will be in that YouTube playlist as well. And that's all available on the um, ISPA resources page. Upcoming events later this afternoon in about an hour, uh, Brian Bates is gonna share 
uh, a short presentation about um, SOPA, mainly geared towards teachers and um, helping them uh, understand where they fit into all this. And um, that'll be made available as a recording also on our webinars page. So if there's things that you wanna follow up on at some point with teachers, you can do that. Um, slide deck should be available as well. Um, and really um, the presentation is, it's got some background in it for SOPA, but it's also just, there's just a couple slides in there for teachers that um, I think will help uh, alleviate alleviate some, some issues with uh, what is going around out there as far as um, possible downfalls to SOPA and all those types of things. Also, just to keep it on your uh, radar, we do have some Be Connected um, sessions coming up. We're doing weekly of those as well. And those are on Thursday afternoons at one o'clock. Uh, upcoming conversations are around content filters and student information systems. So if you have experience with either one of those, which I'm guessing most of you do, uh, please join in the conversation there as well. And then obviously all of our events are listed on our webpage as well. So questions up to this point uh, with regards to any of those things that I uh, shared, and then uh, we'll uh, kind of run through some of these uh, questions as well. I see one question in chat and I'll, I'll respond to that. Um, is agreement on 128 from the SDBC site, the most recent the, from the council of uh, school attorneys? Um, there is, we haven't got feedback from them yet <clears throat> um, for uh, what they, they had a meeting last week. Um, so we don't have the update or anything like that. And, um, but at this point, um, the agreement that is there is still a viable agreement. Um, but obviously, as that information comes available, I will share that um, when we accept that new agreement from them. So going through the questions here, is there a good resource for determining what apps we need to register for? Example, if a teacher uses an app but not the students, a flowchart or something. No, there's not at this point. Um, the basic rule is if there's student data in the uh, in the um, used by the application, then you need an agreement. Um, but we'll definitely try to come up with that that kind of a solution. That's been mentioned a couple times, and that's um, something that we can look at doing. Uh, what is the risk for non-compliance? You will go to SOPA jail. Really, it's going to be up to. I think it's up to the state's attorney or the uh, attorney general. Um, and I could be wrong with who it's up to, but um, compliance isn't based on Illinois State Board of Education. It is based on, this is a law from the legislature. Obviously it's being pushed down. Just the risk is that it's the right thing to do to know where your student data is and have an agreement about how they're using it and what they're going to do with it. If you're no longer a customer, what are they gonna do with their, their data, your data? Um, so the risk is ultimately that what are some good examples of platforms that do not need a privacy agreement? Really, the main thing is, is if it has any student data in it, it's going to be, I mean, if you, if you have an example of something that you're questioning, whether or not, um, those are going to be questions that are going to be, um, on a one-off question, it's going to be a collective like if one school gets an agreement with a vendor, then there's an agreement with that vendor. If um, if it's something that like whitehouse.gov, like that's a resource that you're using in your district, but you're probably not, that's something that you would list as far as something for curriculum usage, but it wouldn't be something that would have student information or that they're using their first name or their last name or their email address to log into that. They're not creating information inside of that application to uh, be stored in that application, like a Canva or a, a Google or, or something like that. So Chris, um, Brian, Brian yeah. has a good example in the chat. He says, uh, what about an app that only a teacher uses? 
but they type in student name or email address into the app, but the student is not communicated with and has no access. Would we need an agreement? I would say yes, because you're providing student information to a, you're, you're housing student data in a application and you want to know where that's at and what they're going to do with it and how they're going to use it and what's going to happen to it when you no longer utilize them. Another question comes up from Chris F. Um, and I think of like Kahoot for this example. We've had questions like, what if they only use a pseudonym and not the student's real name? I know we're kind of splitting hairs, but just yeah. trying to think down yeah. this like question tree idea. Yep, yep. Um, and those are very good questions. And, and like, and thanks Beth for helping out with the moderation here. Um, so can yeah. I, can I jump in on that, Chris, real quick? Yeah, absolutely. That's what we're so here for. One of the things that we had said that with Kahoot, yeah, they might be playing it, but anytime they actually hit that share to classroom button, because there's a way to play it live in your classroom, but there's also a way to play it so that it is student pace. So anything that is ever hit shared to classroom has to be reported out. That's good. Thanks, Amber. All right, let's look at some other questions. And, and if you want, if we need to, ha to have more clarification on different things, please share, uh, reach out to me offline and we can, and we can do that. Uh, we are started, we are starting with paid app, paid for apps. Our learn platform stats indicate over 4,000 potential applications in use. Makes sense to start somewhere we can handle. Absolutely. Um, obviously you can't tackle 4,000 apps, um, but you can tackle the paid for ones and, and just kind of uh, seeing where that goes. Obviously, if there's, there's just going to, there's going to be a point where you're doing your best effort. There may be a time where you can't do everything, but to say, we're not going to do it, or we don't know where to start, or we don't know what to do, I think is, um, is short-sighted and we just need to um, start somewhere um, and utilize the database uh, as a resource for what's out there, what has an agreement, um, and those types of things. Uh, what qualifies as student information? Basically, anything that has um, first name, last name, and, and um, email, uh, any kind of demographic information is going to be there um, as far as student information. Uh, if an operator enters changes in the Exhibit A, do those only apply to the district that signed the NDPA or does any district's exhibit E inherit those changes? So that kind of goes along with that idea that you can, um, if you piggyback on that agreement as it is posted on the site, you are saying that you're agreeing to what's ever in that agreement. If there's something in the exhibit H, then you're agreeing as a subscribing school to that exhibit H. Um, and that's where you would need to make sure that your legal counsel has signed off on that. Uh, a lot of people have reached out to Google, but are still in process. Any suggestions for this corporation? We're going to work at this as a collaborative effort. Um, and I don't think it's going to be the sheer numbers of people that reach out to them and, and ask for an agreement. Um, it's going to be working with them. We're working with them at the national level. Um, so that we can kind of work with the NDPA. There's 32 different states that are part of the SDPC um, that would benefit from a national privacy agreement with Google. Um, obviously, because of SOPA, there's an Exhibit G, which is the state portion for Illinois that we would need to get okayed. But as far as the, as far as like a Google goes, if the NDPA is consistent through all those 32 states, then there's just a smaller subset of information that Google's gonna have to look at for Illinois, for California, for Colorado, for New York. And so um, I guess I don't wanna get too hung up on any one particular agreement. If, if you try and you look at that and you see something in the database, and, and I'm gonna show you some things in the database that would help, um, understand who's reached out to who and, and those types of things. But as far as Google goes, um, the same with Microsoft, all these other uh, bigger corporations that everybody's using. Um, it really just takes one 
agreement and then we can all kind of piggyback on that agreement. So maybe those one of those agreements that every legal counsel is going to look at and say that it's okay. But so it may be an individual agreement for everybody, but ideally what we hope to get is an Illinois NDPA and have them sign it. And, and again, that may be wishful thinking. It may be pie in the sky. It may be Chris has no idea what's really happening, but um, I think that's, we, we don't need to, um, I don't know, lose any sleep over whether Google is going to sign the agreement or not. There's going to be something in place that'll allow us to continue to use Google. Uh, uh, what is everyone using to obtain a list of apps being used in their district? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just basically put that into a chat answer. If you want to answer that in the chat, what you're using for your list of apps. I know there's people sending out uh, Google Forms. There's people just having teachers submit them. Uh, there's applications like Learn Platform and Catch On. Uh, approve it is another option um, from a Google standpoint. Uh, your MDM, all those types of things. So feel free to share those in the chat. Uh, where's the copy of the Illinois NDPA? If you go to the uh, ISPA website, uh, you can find that on there. Um, it's part of the presentation from earlier. Uh, what level of audit net, audit logging is recommended? We are concerned about audit, advanced logging eating the network performance. This is an interesting question, and I don't know the answer to it, but I think do we need to do we need sign signed agreements for self-hosted SIS platforms? Worst case scenario is you reach out to that provider for an Illinois NDPA and you get some kind of agreement with them. I feel like that's the base, best case scenario is that you go ahead and try and get that agreement. Um, whether or not you need to have one, I don't know. They, I mean, they still have access into your system. Do they ever, I mean, do they have backdoor access into your system? Do they not? Um, do you ever allow them to into your system? So I guess I would just question um, why you wouldn't have one. Uh, more than I would question whether or not I need to have one. And that's just me as tech coordinator person, not necessarily anybody that has a law degree or would back you up in a court of law. Someone posted a document based on input from their attorneys. It says we can share student first names and last names without a DPA. Can we share names? But I will, I will take some of these questions um, and and look at some of these things a little bit further in depth um, and try to make those available for you and, and bring these up um, as we go forward into future weeks. Does anybody else have a, a specific question um, that they would want to unmute and ask before we move on to any how-to stuff? I have a question. Hi, Chris. It's Amanda um, Hi. Brookfield. <laughs> um, I have a question on how people are finding the third-party operators that vendors are using, and and the best way to go about doing that. If someone has a a, a tip for that, I know that's one of the hardest parts of all this is is figuring out that and um, getting that information from the the vendor or whether it's listed on their website or something like that. So I know there's a few examples in the database um, of people that have found like a web link or the company sent them a web link to who does their uh, subcontracting. Um, but uh, if anybody does have any examples of, of what they've done specifically, uh, if you wanna share those with me or share them right now, that'd be awesome. Yeah, sorry. So uh, there was a question that someone posted around um, the state like testing platforms and, and how our role is. So like I reached out to DRC and they responded to me saying, well, you, you, need, to, you need to go contact the ROE for the agreement where, it, so, so I didn't know if that was something that is gonna be worked out between the state and those vendors, and we don't have to get our individual NDPAs for those testing vendors. So any any guidance on that? 
Yeah, I, th I mean, I think I kind of put those all in the same bucket. The IAR, the ISA, all yeah, those, those. Um, CIS, um, all that stuff into the same bucket as in as we move forward, we'll have a better idea of that. And, and I think if you're using something for individual assessment, like an NWE map or, or um, Renaissance learning or something like that, then you definitely need to have your own. But I feel like um, the, the state type programs, the, the WIDA and the access and the DRC and IAR, all those will be kind of, there'll either be an agreement that we'll be able to piggyback on, or there'll be some kind of um, basic web link or something that would take us to a, a, a listing of those sites uh, on the ISB website or on the ROE website or something that we could just point to as part of our listing of, of the different applications. And Amanda, I wasn't, I, hopefully I didn't like not answer your question, but I, I think if, if people do have feedback and I will get additional information for you uh, when it comes to that. And then the question on logging, um, I think um, logging is just a matter of uh, what is good for your district. I mean, obviously it comes with everything else. What's the risk of, of having, uh, you weigh that risk of, What's too much information, not enough information. Um, and I guess it, it kind of depends on what your uh, district has to do. And like you said, does it impact network performance? Does it in, impact um, this space? Can we, act, if we do collect a bunch of stuff, are we going to be able to sift through it to find out what, what it is we need to know when it comes to uh, needing to find out what we need to find out? So the progress workflow is part of uh, the new requests, the uh, request area to help you know that you need a specific agreement for a resource. So you can put all those applications in there um, and then they're part of your database. And then you can um, basically take those through your workflow, uh, which would mean like, you sent a request out to uh, the vendor, and so you're waiting on something to come back. Uh, when you get something back, then you can have that uh, change that workflow to show that you're you're working towards something. Um, the other benefit of this is that other people can see this as well. Um, so if you, um, so I just kind of put the text in here for the for the um, what that workflow looks like, and then the last slide will be. Um, how you actually manage this. So if I go to the LTC services ISPA website, again, I can see the upcoming events on the right hand side. I can see uh, the resources down the middle and I can log on to the ISPA website and I'm gonna log in as a district. That workflow process is right here under account management. So you go to manage workflow and then you'll see the steps in your workflow that are there. Uh, if you wanna add a step, you would. So I will take this text and that's why I put this here. So you can utilize this if you want, if you want to. So I can say, will not sign TPAs and I'm gonna make this step number five and I'm gonna cut and paste this in here and add that. So now that I've added my workflow, um, I already had the first four steps in there, but basically you repeat those steps for adding things that you want in there. And then um, what you're able to do then with that workflow is once you add a new request. So a new request would be equivalent to adding a new agreement or adding, going to add agreement, but you don't have a contract. So a new request and a, a, a new agreement without a contract, basically you, you're requesting that I have, uh, I need a request for an agreement with this company. Um, so if I come in here and I choose one of these, 
Britannica, I can go in ahead and fill out this information here if I want to for my district, not necessarily for uh, the possible use, but who's actually using it in my district. Um, I can say it's for all content levels. I can say that I'm the requester. This is also information that would be similar if you utilize the um, the request link inside of the tools for your digital re resource request form. If you put that on your website for your teachers or for your administrators, they can fill that out. And ultimately that would fill out this information. Um, so to find these, if you go to your district agreements and manage agreements, you'll see the different agreements that you have. If they're active, they'll be, um, they'll have an agreement with them. If they're not active, then they'll have this workflow uh, that you're trying to work through. So you can select that the request. So I send a, an email with the sample communication off to Britannica Digital Learning, and I want to update myself. So if you had multiple people within your um, organization, you could send that information to them with this update. So when I click on update, um, I can come back and I can see that the workflow is set to request uh, that the request was sent. I'm also going to get an email because I chose for me to get it. Um, also, if anybody, so if you've noticed in view statewide new requests, you'll see, and I'm going to choose LTC because that's who I am. So you'll notice this subscribe over here to the right and un unsubscribe. So if it's unsubscribe, that means that you are subscribed. If it says subscribe, then if I click on it, I'll be subscribed. Um, and what that does is anytime something gets updated, and this would be one of those request features that I need to put in there, is that when you do something that it comes back to where you left off. Um, so now if I would go into uh, if any, any district updates their progress and you're subscribed to that um, application resource, then you will get an email saying that now they have the request sent or they're in communications received. Um, you'll, you'll get an email saying that something's happened. And so when it gets to that point that they have an agreement with an Exhibit E, then you would know that that somebody's already started that process and now they've got the agreement. So now I can go in and do the Exhibit E process and um, piggyback on their agreement. So that was real quickly. Um, it may need to do some rewinding um, on the YouTube channel, but um, that's the basis for how the workflow can fit into your workflow but also how it may fit into um, other people's workflow. So if I came into using the uh, view state ride requests, and if I came in here and I looked at um, the progress and I see that uh, Charleston's already sent a request, if I subscribe to that as Charleston then updates that progress, if they update that progress and when they update that progress, then I will receive an email saying that something's happened, um, some progress has been made. And then when it gets to that point of that they have a signed agreement, then I can go in and do the, the piggyback. So that was real quickly how to utilize um, the workflow. Uh, and um, there's some sample text here uh, that you can cut and paste into your workflow. Um, but that is something that each district has to set up on their own. Um, and you can add other things in there if it's helpful for curriculum vetting or um, budgeting or, or different things or purchasing other things in there. If this database is helpful for that, then you're, you're welcome to add additional steps in there as well. So there's still time if you have... Um, other things you want me to show or share, I can do that. Um, 
but uh, ultimately your next steps are asking questions, uh, looking at those resources, looking at the YouTube playlist, um, connecting with others, whether it be through these sessions or through uh, other means through um, email forums and stuff like that and, and watching our on-demand stuff, but also um, catching up with us next week uh, on Tuesday afternoon and we'll have some more stuff. And, and if you have things that you wanna see, things that you need information on, things that you think would be important to other people, please share those with me and I can um, share those next week as well. So I'll open it up for questions. I'll stick around as long as anybody's in the room.